I'm a member of the Mathematical Science Center and we have a particle physics group in this Mathematical Science Center. I'm a member of, uh, associate member of the CERN theory department, so that's my background. And the set, just to give, a, give you an, an idea then, the Math Center of Mathematical Science is one of three centers within the School of Computing, Electronic and Mathematics. What I would like to do today is to talk about quantum cryptography and that's roughly the outline I would, what I would like to show you. So we start with a crash course in quantum physics. Then I will go through the basic uh, steps in cryptography. I will talk about 5,000 years of legacy in cryptography using substitution cipher and that will give us a warm-up exercise. We, we are learning a little bit how to decipher this gravestone here. And then I switch to modern cryptography, and modern means it's indeed for mathematics standards, it's very young, it's a couple of 50 years old, modern cryptography, and then we bring both together cryptography and quantum physics and talk about uh, then the, the new paradigm of uh, quantum cryptography. So that, that's, a, that's a program. So quantum physics essentials. So how do we describe matter and light? So uh, we consider objects as tiny little spheres <laughs> traveling in, in a piece of metal. They are negatively charged. If you, you, you know that very well. If these objects move, that is what we call a current. And then, of course, we have an idea how these things evolve. And, of course, in, uh, there is an assumption in everyday life. And uh, we assume that these tiny little particles basically behave as big particles like a football. So uh, we know how a football works. And the uh, ba basic assumption is, you know we, we know, we can actually measure the position of the football and we can also measure the velocity of the football. We, and once we know that, we have, uh, since Newton, the classical law of mechanics, we can calculate where the football is and so on and we know what happens. So that's a very big uh, success story of, of, of human nature that we extrapolate. What do I mean by that? We assume if this works for a football, this also works for the tiny little particles. right? And that is an assumption which we're going to test a little bit later. So, so what, what are particles historically? Particles historically are point-like objects. And why do we know that if particles hit a screen if you have an electron beam hit, hitting a screen, we see them emerging as, as point-like point speckles. And if you change the resolution of the screen, the speckles become smaller. So it's a very good working assumption that an electron hitting a screen once at a time is showing us this pattern here that electrons are particles. So that's historically why we think of electrons as a particles. What is light historically? Well, historically, we say light is made out of waves. And why, why do we know that? So, so what is a wave? A wave has a very important uh, property, namely, it can have interference patterns. So that's an example here with water waves. Basically, you have a water wave and another water wave. Basically means this is uh, water is high, the water level is high, water level is low, water level is high. And then you know what happens if, if a water level high hits a water level low on the other side, then basically you get a, a flat surface at this point, and that is what we call interference. And, and that, that is what we call waves. And, and then historically, we made one, one very important experiment. We took uh, light, um, the beginning was, was uh, white light, but later on it was laser light with a very specific frequency, and we, we, ha we have this light hitting uh, a double slit in the wall, let's say here, so it hit here and hit here. And then what happens is light is evolving in waves after this slit here and does interfere with the waves coming from the other slit. And then we get, you can calculate this quite easily, uh, you can actually draw it quite easily, you draw a maximum, if a maximum hits a minimum, you, it, it annihilates and you get nothing, you know. So you can draw this very easily and then this is what you see behind on a screen, you get uh, something with high intensity, something with low intensity, and that is what we call an interference pattern, and that's why we say light is made out of waves. So totally different electrons, point-like particles hitting the screen one at a time, light is made out of waves. So what I'm saying now, well, 
that's just an historical accident. I'm, I'm actually arguing that electrons and light are basically the same thing, and they both evolve according to the same theory. So, first of all, and I don't have time to show you the experimental evidence, the first important evidence is that light is also made out of particles, and that was a Nobel Prize from a very well-known person, Albert Einstein, he didn't get his Nobel Prize for the, for the theory of relativity, he got it for what's called the photo effect, which clearly establishes the, the particle nature of, of, of light. And then we say, okay, this made of, uh, as, as electrons, uh, uh, photons also uh, are particles, and they both evolve according to the same <coughs> theory. And that's a theory in a nutshell, we call this quantum mechanics. Basically what we're saying is, well, the particles evolve according to a probability. And then, okay, that's fine. So if you have a high probability finding the particle there, then the particle is moving in the region of high probability and is, is less likely to find in a region where it's low probability, okay? So that, that is, uh, th that's a field coming in. It's a pr probability field, right? And then we say, okay, we have a theory. We need a theory then how this probability evolves in time. That is what replaces uh, Newton's laws of mechanics. And we can do all that, and uh, then, uh, in a nutshell, what happens is that exactly the, the theory which gives the evolution of the probability is a wave theory. That is where the wave theory comes into play. So that is how it is. And, and, I'm, and what I'm going to do now is to show that it's absolutely consistent what we know about electrons and about light. So <coughs> later on, we have to think a little bit, well, what's wrong then if you have a probability? Why? Uh, um, well, why is this not true? We, uh, Newton says we can measure the position and the velocity of particles. Now we only have a probability. Is this true? Well, this is, first of all, we need to uh, keep in mind, this is an assumption what works for the football, not necessarily works for something which is 10 to 15 smaller, right? Or 10 to 22 smaller, sorry for that. Um, then, okay, but this is a quite good theory because if we know, if, if the football is made up of tiny little particles and we know we can predict um, where every tiny little particle is going according to Newton's laws, then it's clear if we can do this for the tiny little particles the football is made of, we can also predict the football. So we have a theory. We have a theory. If this works for the tiny little particles, okay, it works for the football as well and we have explained why the football is behaving as we know. But now we have to come back to this a little bit later. This goes away at the moment. So um, now we, we are saying um, electrons are tiny little particles, footballs with a, with, a, with a position and a velocity. And let's do an experiment and see why, why this can't be true. So what we do is we have uh, a wall and we have two holes in the wall. And then we have uh, something which emits electrons. And it's very important what, that what we're doing is we emit one electron at a time. So we kick one football to, uh, randomly towards the wall. And then we can, behind here, we, we, we trap the football on a screen. And then it makes a, a, a greenish speckle here. And then we have the location of the football behind. So if you would do this with a wall and a football, this is 5 meters, this is 50 <coughs> centimeters, a football at 30 centimeters. You kick randomly, what do you get? Well, you get a pile of footballs here and a pile of footballs here, right? And it's one at a time. It's not that two footballs actually collide, you know, because you kick one football, it hits the screen, and once it's, uh, the football hit the screen, you start another football. So it's one at a time. So it's no, no possibility that two footballs interact. Yeah, you wait long enough, right? So the football scenario is, okay, pile of footballs here, pile of footballs here. And you can make this experiment on Sunday at home. Now, this experiment was repeated, not with footballs, but with electrons. And that is a very a famous experiment. Uh, it's called the Tonomura experiment done at Hitachi. And that's a small video I'm showing you now what happens. Now we are looking at the detector playing on the monitor. Bright spots appear here and there. These spots indicate individual electrons. Electrons are sent out only occasionally. Therefore, the chance of finding one electron in the microscope is very small, not to mention the chance of finding two. 
Uh, since electrons are detected one by one as particles, we have to conclude that each electron must have passed through at random on either side of the biprism, thus creating a uniform distribution without any interference when accumulated. Under such conditions do electrons form a uniform distribution? But look, we begin to see some fringes in the perpendicular direction that looks like interference fringes. Since this experiment lasted for more than 30 minutes, I have sped the movie up. Interference fringes are now clearly visible. Okay, so what we're seeing here is an experiment, not with footballs, but with something which is smaller. And each of these greenish points here are one electron hitting at a time. So one electron, it has to go through or through. So, so you would expect a pile of electrons here if you, if you follow Newton's law or the football idea. But this is what you see. <coughs> so it, you see it, electrons are particles quite clearly because we see them hitting once at a time. And they're pretty much point-like, right? But after a while, you see an interference pattern. You see an interference pattern. So how do we explain that? So you have to change your idea. So the good thing about quantum physics is you, you cannot not understand it. You know? So if you think you don't understand this, then you still are hooked up with an assumption which comes from everyday life. So what needs to go away now is say, OK, we made an assumption, and it was a good theory. We made the assumption electrons are tiny little footballs, and that explains what a football does because the tiny little particles do it, was a good theory, but it simply was an assumption. Assumption is not true. And how does it explain the, the experiment? So we have still an electron, one electron at a time. So how, how can we have an interference pattern? So we can have an interference pattern if the electron just hits the screen according to probability. So here we have a high <coughs> probability hitting, here we have a low probability hitting. And the probability field of an electron hitting, that has a wave equation. So the probability itself can make interference pattern, and an individual electron just follows the probability. And that is a theory what we call quantum mechanics. So that is actually absolutely the same with light. So, so what's the difference? So light is made, as since Einstein we know, light is made out of particles. We call these particles photons, right? Light is made out of particles as well. But uh, the point is if you have a laser hitting, hitting a, um, a hole in the wall, right? You get interference pattern. You, you have millions and billions of these particles. And these particles, according to the theory, quantum electrodynamics, they're not interacting. Footballs would interact. They would scatter. They, 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 they hit each other, scatter. But, but photons are, are very, uh, um, uh, they basically don't interact. So you can, rather than doing it hit once at a time, you could do billions of photons at a time because they don't talk to each other. So basically what you're seeing here is not a wave. What you're seeing here again is the probability field which has the interference pattern and all what the photons do is hit where the probability is telling them to hit and therefore you get more photons hitting here less here because they just follow the probability so that's called in, in, in the past this was called the particle wave duality you know but but actually it's it, it's beautiful because it's just one theory Electrons are particles, photons are particles, and they evolve according to probability. And the theory for probability is a wave equation. And that explains everything. So we have to explain one thing. So if everything hits according to probability and we don't know where the electron is actually is exactly, or we don't know the velocity, so why do we know where the football is? Right? So why do we know velocity and position of the foot, but very, very precisely? So uh, there is one thing uh, we need to be precise here. What do we mean, where is the football? First of all, what we mean by the position of the football, this is maybe we need to define it so we can take the center of mass. The center of mass of a lot of particles, 10 to 24 particles. That well defines where the football is. That's one position in space, and that's where the football is. Velocity, well, we can take simply the average velocity of all these tiny little particles and call this the velocity of the football. 
And there's a wonderful theorem in mathematics uh, developed by Ehrenfest of quantum mechanics, which tells us once you have an average, uh, these averages, and velocity is an average, and position is an average, these averages you can show with the theory of quantum mechanics that those averages obey the classical Newton laws of physics. That's where it comes back. It's not so surprising. Think about it. If you, have, if you throw dice and you have one to six, if you throw one dice, you can actually get anything. You know that. Two, six, four, whatever. Just e we call it equal probability. But if you are interested in, in the average, okay, the average of all numbers, according to theory, should be three, right? And, and of course, three you, you get as, as often as four. But if you throw 10 times, you know, then you can calculate the average. It will be 3.5, okay? You throw a million times dice, then the average is 3.001. You know, that's called the central limit theory. So it's quite natural. So if you have many, many <coughs> particles and an average, this is much more well defined than anything else. Okay, cryptography now. So uh, that's crash course in quantum physics. We, we need this later, the photons, in order to understand quantum cryptography. Let's talk now about cryptography. <coughs> cryptography is actually a very old subject. It starts in <coughs> 2000 before Christ. Hebrew code, uh, it was used in the Roman army to communicate because there wasn't any email or phone or something like that. Uh, somebody has to go to, 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 to northern Germany from Rome to, to deliver a message. And of course, you don't want that anybody changes this message. So it was encrypted at that time. It was unbroken for centuries. It was used in, in, in the First World War. This is the Ludendorff cipher. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And most famously, it was also used uh, in the Second World War by, with the Enigma machine. And all these codes for 5,000 years had <coughs> one thing in common. They are substitution ciphers. So what, what, do, you mean by, what I, do I mean by substitution cipher? So what we do is we replace one letter by another letter. Right? That's a substitution cipher. This Ludendorff cipher is a little bit... Uh, better. So what the Ludendorff cipher does is, well, you have a, a 3 here, and if you have a plain text 3, replace it by D and F, right? If you want to write uh, an A, you replace it, this A, by D and G, you know? So, so you, the message will become twice as big, but what, when you look on the letter, how many, what, what, what letters have you got? Only six of them, A, D, F, G, V, X, a, D, F, G, V, X. So the whole letter is only made out of six characters, and that because you have two characters for each plane. But again, this is just a substitution cipher. So uh, just as a warm-up, I, I would like to hand out the first one here. You're getting that. And um, if, until you get it, let me explain it. We want to learn how we do a Freemason cipher, how do we read this. So that is a gravestone uh, from James Leeson in New York, uh, died 1794. And here you see characters, and that's a cipher, right? And how do you read it? So, so what, you, what you see here is you see a cup, you see uh, something, a dot which is enclosed by a, by a square. You see uh, something which looks like uh, an M with two dots in it. So how do you read it? Well, you read it this way. You, you try to find the character here. So we know we, this is a one dot symbol. So these are all the, the letters with, with have a one dot. Okay, so this is a one dot symbol. And it, it's totally enclosed by four lines. So it's a one dot symbol, totally enclosed by four lines. Okay, that's an E. Okay. First one, it's a two dot symbol, okay, we are here, two dot symbol, and it's only enclosed by one, two, three, so two dot symbol here, one, two, three, okay, that's an R. So that's an R and that's an E. So I give you three minutes now <coughs> to complete that and to read what's written here on the cipher. Okay, I think that's just a warm-up exercise. Thank you. And you can finish it at home. I tell you the solution. It's called uh, Remember Death. 
if you if you decipher it according to this rule. So this is an R. We said this is an E. Let me find this M here. So it's a two dot symbol. So we are here and it has an L shape. So you need to find the L. So this is L, two dot, it's an M. So this is R, E, M, and so on. And you will find it's called remember death, right? And you see what this is? It's a substitution cipher. You know, you can break this with a frequency analysis and so on. A substitution cipher means for one or several uh, plain texts, you, you just choose other characters. That's called a substitution cipher. Okay, so that's 5,000 years. That was all what we had, right? And then things changed quite a bit. Modern cryptography. Uh, so what we need to do now is uh, we need something better. You know, we have a lot of need for cryptography. We want to buy things on Amazon. We would buy eBay and so on. We would communicate with mobile phones. It should be encrypted, right? But then we have a huge problem because exchange of a key is very inconvenient. So let's assume you want to make a money transfer. You go to the bank and say, okay, can I, have a, can I have a code? And you get a code and you go home and then you make your money transfer order. On. But if you're at the bank, you can do your money transfer already there, right? So, so exchange of a key is actually not working for us. We don't want to see anybody from the bank, but we want that the communication is actually secure. So can we do this? Can you actually exchange a key with somebody you never have met before? That, that's the question. And it, it was a problem, a huge problem in cryptography, and we only <coughs> find the solution a couple of 10 years ago. Yes, you can. And it's now called public key cryptography. And I will explain a little bit what this is. It's called RSA, so how does it work? So we don't do a little bit of math later, but not much math. So uh, we have a door, right? And this door has a strange lock. Here, yeah, a strange lock. And why is this door strange? You have two keys to the door. Every key can lock the door and unlock the door, but the only property, the only important feature which we have is, if you lock the door with one key, only the other key can unlock, okay? That's, we can come up with some mechanics which does that. We just, we take it for granted that we have this door. So what can we do with this door now? So in, in, in literature, it's always Alice and Bob who want to exchange a secret message. So Bob prepares himself to get a secret message. So how, how does Bob do this? Well, he has his door and he does the opposite what we do um, in, in, at night, so he leaves the door open, and even more, he puts one of his keys next to the door, right? So, and then he leaves, goes to work. So now, uh, Alice comes along and wants to uh, send Bob uh, a message. Bob is not at home, but the door is open, the key is next to the door. So what Alice does is, she takes her message, put it behind the door, closes the door, picks up the key, and locks the door. So now the, 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 the door is locked and then she drops the key. Okay, so, so but remember, the, the lock is strange. If you lock the door with one key, it's always the other key which unlocks. So she can drop the key because everybody passing by cannot open it because this key doesn't work. It's the other key which is in Bob's pocket, right? So late at night, Bob comes home, finds his door locked, he takes his key out of his pocket, unlocks the door, and finds a message from Alice. Now you see what has happened. Alice has Bob dropped a message, and is absolutely sure only Bob has got the message, but Alice never has met Bob during the whole process. And that's exactly what we need. And that's called a public key crypto system. Who invented this? It was actually invented uh, in, the, you know, in the United Kingdom by government communication headquarters in the early 70s by these guys. And it was immediately <coughs> disclosed because of the, uh, of the high importance until 1997. Why until 1997? Because the other scientists working at the Massachusetts Institute of Technologies had the same idea. They published it. It was Rivas, Chang, and Edelman. And uh, therefore, uh, this publication, of course, was very important. And therefore, this standard uh, is called the RSA method. And if you look at your browser, the lock on your browser says RSA incorporation or RSA encrypted. It's exactly implemented what you have seen here. 
So how complicated is it? Of course, it's not done with, with doors. So how, how complicated is it? Well, it's based uh, on, on factorizing a prime number. So I'm telling you, if you can factorize a prime number, you can break R's A. But okay, factorizing a prime number is not so difficult. You know, 21. So what is 21? 21 is 7 times 3. So I have factorized 21 in 7 times 3. Okay. So what does this mean now? Can I break into the Bank of England from, from my living room? Well, the, the, the numbers are slightly bigger. So that's not one, that's not four numbers, it's one number. So it starts here, goes here, goes here. And, and, the, and this number is own, has only two factors. Yeah? So this number is the product of two other numbers, right? And, and the question is, what, what are the numbers? Okay, and that's a very hard problem in mathematics to find this. And actually, if you a standard algorithm, which we have, and, and a modern desktop, it would take 55 years on a desktop to find the two factors of this number. <coughs> and if you want to know, these are the numbers. <laughs> so, so finding them takes 55 years on a modern desktop, right? But checking it, you can do this on a, with a piece of paper on a rainy Sunday afternoon. You start here, 7 times 9 is 63, you put down 3, re remember 6, and then you go on. <laughs> so it, it takes a couple of 5 hours or so, but, but then you are done. And that's nothing compared to 55 hours in a desktop can millions, do millions of operations in, in a second, right? So that's pretty scary, I would say, right? Because um, the, the whole security of our e-commerce is relying on the fact, on a math problem, right? That we are not able actually to factorize that. And that's a scary bit, you know, because you get people uh, on the autistic spectrum, you give them a phone book, they, they read it, and then you can ask them anything about the phone book, and they're telling you. It's not excluded, it's mathematically not proven that factorizing is necessarily a hard problem. You would love to have this proof. But you don't have it. So it can be that somebody looks at this number and just tells you, yeah, quite clear, this is made out of this number times this number. And you can't exclude that. And the government is, was very worried about these things, so it set up a, a challenge. Giving out this number, you can earn £500,000 at that time. If you find the factors, just <coughs> screening, what, what, what is the ability in the population actually doing this? So... That's modern, modern mathematics. So five, 4,000 years, 5,000 years, we had substitution ciphers. Now we have this public key cryptography. We can exchange secret measures with somebody we, we have never met before, and that's essential for our everyday life. You know, you want to do that. You want to buy something on Amazon, and you don't want to have your invoice changed on the, on the way, right? This is what we want to have, and we have it. And then now we have something else, which is coming up since 2000, and it's, it's a new challenge, an intellectual challenge. So here the question was, can you exchange a message, a secret message with somebody you never met? So you can't do easily a key exchange. Now the question is, well, can we exchange a secret message in the open? And, and we just know that num nobody has eavesdropped, so you're not, you don't need to encrypt at all. You send a message in the open, and you know it's guaranteed that nobody ha except your, your Bob, except Bob, has got the message. <coughs> and, and, and that's guaranteed by the laws of nature. So, sounds wonderful. You, you don't need to encrypt. You, you're, only, you, you're absolutely sure nobody else got it. You know, that's good enough. So you don't need to encrypt at all. You can send it in plain, in plain sight. So how does this work, this concept? So, I mean, Go back to quantum mechanics. So we already saw uh, photons. So we know now light is made out of particles which we call photons. And there's one important property which comes out of the theory which we call quantum electrodynamics. There's one important property, uh, that, that's the property that the photon has two possible states. State one, state two, which we call polarization. Okay? You don't need to know more about this, just two states. So how can we make then a photon with a particular polarization? Well, we can use a polarization filter. So the photons come with any polarization indicated by this vector here. But if, if, if we let it, then the screen, we know that after the screen, uh, the polarization only what fits through the slit 
this is the, 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 the analogon of, of this, then we know, okay, we made all, all photons which survive this process have the right polarization. So we can make photons with a particular polarization. How do we detect polarizations? Well, photons which, which polarize in this direction just pass through. And if, 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 you don't, if you don't get the right orientation of the filter, you don't get anything. So we can detect the polarization. Now the interesting bit comes if we have now something in between. If we have a filter which is skewed. And now that's the quantum mechanics bit. Again, remember, photon is a particle. And, and the evolution is according to probability. So this is one particle. And if you have a polarization, it doesn't fit almost 45 degrees skewed, you know. So, so what, what happens quantum mechanically? So quantum mechanically, basically, with 50% probability, you get this state. And with 50% probability, you get the other state. But of course, you, you only get in quantum mechanics one photon on the other side. He says, one particle hitting after the screen, you after the filter, you have one particle. So the only thing what can change is the state of the particle. And then the question is according to the laws of quantum mechanics, evolution of this probability. So what, what are you getting? And, and the point is, in 50% of the cases, you get that. In 50% of the cases, you get that. And that is what we're going to use now. And once you've got that, of course, uh, you cannot recover uh, the, the, the information, and that's important as well. Now, we need to do something. <clears throat> we're going to use that, but we need also to convey information. And we are going to use two different types of filters. We use filters which are <coughs> like a cross, or like a cross, you know what I mean. So, so one, one 90 degrees oriented and the skewed one, and of course, we have this filter admits photons with two polarizations. This polarization passes through, and that polarization passes through. And we call, if we detect with this filter a photon with this polarization, we call this zero. And if we detect a photon with this polarization, we call it one. OK, that's just convention. If we use the other filter, we, 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 we make the convention if it passes through this way, we call this a zero, and if you detect this photon, which goes through, we call it a one. Okay, that is our translation table of information. So now <coughs> Alice wants to send Bob, or wants to get exchange a secret key with Bob, maybe to use it uh, for, for, for other cipher sends, or it's called quantum key exchange. So Alice wants to exchange a key with Bob, and Eve is actually trying to, to get the key. So what, what Alice does now, Alice prepares a random filter setting and transmits a random bit sequence. It can be, it's entirely random. So Alice can choose this one here, or that one, or that one, and that one, and so on. So this is just random, totally random. And uh, what, what is this setting numbers? So well, these are all photons, so Alice can prepare those photons with filter settings. So what, what is the numbers? So the numbers are, okay, remember, something like that, okay, something like that is here. This is a zero, okay, this is a zero. That one, okay, that fits in here. That one, it's also a zero, okay, that's also a zero. This one here, okay, it's, it fits this filter here, and it's in, <coughs> polarized in this direction horizontally, okay, that's a one, okay, that's a one, that's a zero. We had this, okay, here that we had before, it goes through, it's, it's 45 degrees, it passes through here, that's a one, okay? So whatever Alice prepares, we can translate with our lookup table, we can translate this into a sequence of bits, right? So next thing, that is, that will be the key, or part of the key, uh, or the key will be in this bit sequence uh, later on, and what Bob does is, okay, Without knowing what, what Alice is doing, just Bob, Bob prepares. And Bob prepares a random filter setting. So Bob has two types of filters. Bob can have this filter or that filter. And he just places it all over the place. So like this, randomly. Bob places randomly and starts receiving, once he has made his choice for the filter setting, so 5 to 12, uh, he, he knows Alice is sending uh, signals at 12 o'clock, 5 to 12, 
Bob prepares a random setting and is waiting for the sickness coming in. The sickness comes in and then Bob reads, okay? So, if this comes in, you know, this is wrong. That's 45 degrees wrong. That don't go through neither vertical nor horizontal. That's cute. And then remember, if it's cute, you get 50% either one case or the other. So, I put down a 1, but I could equally well put down a, a, a 0. This is just random, okay? Fine. The, this one here, okay, that's good. That is a, uh, this comes in, my filter is correct. So that is necessarily, if this is 0, that's a 0, and it's not, not random, right? Because it passes through. This one here, let me see that. Okay, again, this is horizontal pluralized, but we have the x here. So that's a skewed. And again, according to quantum mechanics, you get either or. It's 50% probability. I did put down, in this case, a 1, but I could have chosen 4. It's completely random. And so on. Sometimes this is random. This fits. Okay, that, this one goes through. That is skewed because it's vertical, hitting across. So that's random. This one here is uh, random. This one here fits. So you see you get something which is, goes through and something which is random, okay? So once Bob got the message, right, then what Bob does is, okay, uh, I have, my, have all my data, so we close down the communication channel, and then Bob picks up the phone. And what Bob does is calls Alice and asks Alice, what was your filter setting? And Alice says, okay, my first filter setting was that. My second filter, and Eve can, can listen. You don't care. Eve can listen. So Alice says, okay, this one, 45 degrees this way. This one was vertical. My third one was horizontal. And Bob writes it down, right? So sickness have all gone, and Bob now has Alice's filter setting. So the next thing what Bob does is simply, okay, now once Bob and Eve has a filter setting as well, but Eve doesn't have the signals, right? So, so now, all of a sudden, what uh, uh, Bob does is Bob compares and says, <coughs> okay, uh, I, got, I got a one here, but this filter setting doesn't match. That's wrong. So Bob knows whatever came here, this is a wrong filter setting. Bob knows this is random. So we, we don't look at it. We discard it. Bob says, okay, Alice had a vertical filter setting. I, Bob was, I was using a cross. So this is a matching filter setting. Whatever came through this channel is true, right? So we take this one here as a true piece of information. This filter setting, Alice was horizontal, Bob was cross, doesn't match, random result, we discard. This was 45 skewed, uh, vertical polarization here, no match, random result, we, we, we discard. Well, this was... Uh, 45 degrees, that was a cross, that's a match. Whatever came through is true. So then you make a list of things, okay. No match, yes, a match. No match, no match, yes, a match. No match, no match, yes, a match. And then you know, wherever you found a yes, the signal is actually true. The signal is really the signal from Alice. So you know, that's a zero, that's a one, that's a one, and then you go on, and that's the first three bits of your key, right? So, what we do now is we, 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 we do this and, uh, in a little exercise. So what you do is, uh, you get that and you leave it that, uh, that way. So what you should get, you should look at what's called Bob. You, know, you are Bob now and you're getting, a, in, in a minute, you get uh, a message from Alice, okay? So this is what you get, step one. <clears throat> so what you do is now, as I said, we're preparing us, Alice is going to send us a message. So what we do is now, well, we choose a random signal here, a random filter setting. You can use a, a, a cross or a uh, well, yeah, vertical a filter setting or a cross. So put a plus or an X in these boxes and be as random as you want. OK, 
okay, that's quick and easy. Once we have done that, we are getting a message from Alice, and that means you unfold it this way. So you have your random. That's just an example, of course. This was my random setting. You have a different random setting now, yeah? But now what you do is you, you put in, you, you construct the signal, right? That means, okay, I had a, a plus here. Maybe you haven't got a plus, you know? But the rules are, basically, if it goes through, then you copy. So this is a vertical signal, and it goes through through my vertical filter. So I put down a vertical line here. If I haven't got a match, if I haven't got a match, what you do is you, you randomly choose one, okay? So this one here, it goes through, yeah, it's, it's 45 degrees, I have an X, okay, this goes in here. Here, I have, okay, vertical, vertical, yes, it goes through, that is horizontal, yes, it goes through. Now here's the next interesting bit, this is horizontal, but I have an X. So that isn't a match, so I randomly choose one of those orientation. I either choose this way or I choose that way. I, I don't care, you know, or leave it out, you know. You only, you only construct, because these are anyhow random, you only construct the signals which match, okay? That is all, you know, this is the rules written down, but, you know, don't read this and, and follow the algorithm. <clears throat> it simply means, you know, if, if, if you have a match, then you copy the signal, right? If, if you have a match, if matches, if, if you if it don't match, you choose randomly one of the axes, you know. This is not a match, it's 45 degrees, so that's not a match. So what you do is you choose either that or that, you know. So whenever... You, you don't have a match, you randomly choose one of the axes of what you have put down, you know, or you leave it blank. That's equally fine. <coughs> okay, I'll be there. So whenever it matches, you copy the signal. If it don't matches, you, you put random something, you know, or you leave it blank. So that, that was the stage. Alice was sending our signals via glass fiber, uh, and now the transmission stops. And what we do now is we pick up the phone and call Alice, and call Alice and ask Alice, what was your filter setting? And that is unfolding it this way. Now you look above, you have, let me illustrate that. So what you, what you do, it, you, you look, now you have, you have Alice filter setting and you have your filter setting, okay? And then uh, that's Alice signals and that's your filter setting. And Alice is telling you now, okay, that it was vertical, that was 45, vertical, horizontal. That is what Alice is telling you now on the phone, right? And all what you do is you, 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 you copy down or you color in whenever you got a match, okay? This is vertical, that matches your filter setting, okay? That's a match. That was. 45, that was 45, that's a match. That was vertical, vertical, yes, that was a match. That was a match. This wasn't a match, so this is green as well. But here, this was is, is horizontal and that's an X. So that doesn't match, so you don't color in that one. This is something you have to discard later, right? So all what you do now is you color in whether, whether L signal does match accidentally your filter setting. And, and you shade it, you know, so if you have, you have Alice uh, setting and then you have your setting and you shade your setting any time you get a match with the filter settings, okay? Okay, so, so uh, we can hang up the phone now, so we, 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 we calibrated the filter settings and the, the only a uh, person who has the, the, the photons uh, or the information on the photons is Bob, it's you. So now what you can do is whenever you have something shaded in, you know this transmission was correct. If you haven't got a shade, then it means the, these things, these photons <coughs> are random, right? 
So whenever you have a shade, you know that signal was was indeed from Alice. True. Whereas we haven't, uh, where you haven't got a shade, you, you you don't you ignore. So all what you need to do now is whenever you have a match, right? If you have shaded in, you you look what you've got, what your signal you got, and you copy it down here. So we got a vertical one here. We got a 45 because it's shaded. We copy it down here. We would copy down this one and so on. If you don't have a shade, we leave it open, right? We don't copy it down. If you don't have shaded, we don't copy it. Okay, that, that's what we do now. Okay, and final step is very easy. Remember we had a, is it here? No. Uh, we had a lookup table uh, where, we, where we, call, we call this zero, where we can translate this polarization states into numbers. Let me find it for you. Here, so if it's vertical, it's a zero. If it's this one, it's one. That is a zero and that is a one. So what's, what's left now to be done is simply to translate this one into a bit sequence, okay? And then you see what has happened. Uh, you know, Alice knows that. Alice knows, Alice knows what she has sent, and she knows her filter settings. And Bob has the same information. So Alice and Bob are constructing the same bit sequence. And Eve has, has, has overheard the phone call. She knows the filter setting, but haven't got the photons. Right, so she can't reconstruct that, and there you see what happens. Alice and Bob can agree on on a filter setting on a key, right? Sorry, can agree on a key, which then goes into RSA or something else, you know, or you you in, uh, you have a one-time uh, TAN system or whatever, you know. So so why is this secure? So what what happens is okay. Alice is already has heard the, the phone call. Okay. She knows the filter setting. So what Alice needs to do, needs to get the photons as well. But the point is if, if Alice actually, okay, goes in between. So, so a photon comes this way, right? So, so what should Alice do? She, Alice can only actually decide on a filter setting. She knows Bob and Alice are using vertical, uh, the plus sign filter or the cross X filter. Yeah, okay. So, so, what ha so the idea would be, okay, the photon comes from Alice, Bob is here. So what I do is I place a filter in the middle, right? I put a filter in the middle and if the, the photon is this way and I, I have accidentally chosen plus, this photon goes through, I know it was this polarization and it goes on to Bob, okay? But I don't know which photon is coming, so, so in 50% of the cases, I choose the wrong filter. So if I if I put in a plus, that's fine. But if I accidentally have chosen an X, what happens? This photon, I first of all I could detect it, but what goes to Bob is 50% either up or, or wrong. So what happens is okay, Eve can Eve drops on 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 the photons as well. But in 50% of the cases, Bob gets the wrong information. So Alice and Bob are reconstructing a key, both of them, and they come up with a number. But Bob had got 50% of the photons wrong, and he got 50% of the numbers wrong. So all what you have to do, that's easily detectable. You do at the end, you do one checksum, you know, you sum it up or come up with something clever and, 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 and just check whether you, 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 you agree, you know. And if you agree, you check some 50% wrong of your key, you will find quite easily. Let's say this has 1,024 bits, 50% 50, 50 512 are wrong, you will find this quite easily. Yeah? You can make cross checks and you, whatever you can. So, so that's easily detectable, right? So, so the thing is now that you don't encrypt it all. So, so you send your, 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 your photons as in the open. If somebody interferes with your photons, you will notice by the checksum, right? If, you're, if, 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 both checks, if the checksum is correct, then you know nobody has interfered, right? And that means you have transmitted a key in the open, and the only thing what you know, guaranteed by the laws of nature, that nobody else has the key, 
right? So no encryption at all, but nobody else has the key. So let me summarize. <clears throat> Ah, yeah, that's what I said, sorry, before I summarize. So, so that, that's what I said, you know, Photon comes in, Alice, uh, Eve, Eve has to choose a filter, if she gets it wrong, this moves on 50% of the cases with the wrong orientation, and then that you can detect. 50%, if Eve, Eve drops, then 50% of the bits are wrong, and then that you easily find, you know, with a, with a checksum. <coughs> Yeah, okay, Eve could, uh, the phone call Bob to Alice is after uh, the exchange of the photons, so, so, so Eve can get the filter settings, but not the photons anymore, because Eve has no possibility to recover the initial photonic state. So the, the upshot is the key is openly transmitted, and, and you only know exactly uh, if somebody else has the key or not. And if nobody else got the key, you can actually use it as a password. So this is now the evolution of, in mathematics we have seen, or, uh, yeah, that's a summary, 2000 before Christ, even up to World War II. So we, we just were using um, more and more complicated substitution ciphers. So Caesar cipher is just a, a, a rotation of the alphabet, you know, but Ludendorff cipher is a little bit more complicated using two characters for one character, substitution cipher, and Enigma was just a very, very high tech engineering uh, machine which does a substitution for you and, and but it needs a key and, and deciphering actually Enigma was actually to get some ideas about the, 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 the Enigma settings you know so it was just a very complicated substitution cipher and that all changed in, in, 19, in the 1970s uh, when we came across uh, public key crypto systems now and, and, and this is what we desperately need in our everyday life. We want to exchange secret messages, but we, we don't want to meet a person, you know, in order to exchange a key, you know, that, that is what we don't want. So, and that we can have now with the RSA, but still, this is still a little bit scary because it hinges on a math problem, namely that we can't factorize big numbers quite easily, right? We can multiply big numbers even on a piece of paper, but the inverse procedure, namely to get the factors, is, is very, very involved. But the problem is now, there is no guarantee that it must be hard. So if somebody comes about with some new clever idea, then, then all RSA and, and all e-commerce goes out of the window. And, and there's a step up now, in, in starting year 2000, actually the, 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 the physics and the mathematics was from 1983, but in 2000 companies came on the market doing that, is actually a quantum, uh, quantum cryptography using uh, a key exchange in the open, but just actually make sure that nobody else got the key. You know, this is a quite a mathematical evolution. So you meet, exchange a key, and you just say, for an A, I use a W, you know, and so on. You know, that was Caesar cipher, you know, very early on. That got more clever with Enigma, of course, yeah, but still it was mathematically just a substitution cipher. And now we are, uh, then, then there was this challenge, you know, we don't want to meet, but we still want to uh, crypt, uh, use cryptography, okay? And we can do it. Math has given us that. And now physics has given us something new, which is more secure than that, in a sense, because we can't guarantee that factorizing prime numbers is hard. But this is secure, is, is guaranteed by nature. You know, Eve has no possibility. It's guaranteed by the laws of nature that Eve cannot reconstruct the photons. That's it, built in in quantum mechanics, right? Okay, thank you. <laughs>